Psalms chapter 119, and we'll read verse 25, and then a, a few verses up to the end of the chapter. So Psalm 119, verse 25, my soul clings to the dust, give me life according to your word. And down to verse 37, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Verse 40, behold, I long for your precepts in your righteousness, give me life. Verse 88, in your steadfast love, give me life, that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Verse 107, I am severely afflicted, give me life, O Lord, according to your word. And then finishing up uh, verse 154, verse 154 and 159 says this, plead my cause and redeem me, give me life according to your promise. Consider how I have loved your precepts, give me life according to your steadfast love. And then just the first seven verses of Psalms chapter 85. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgive the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away our indignation, your indignation towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you for the reading of the precious word of God. This is Mother's Day, and uh, I had planned to preach a Mother's Day message, actually, and then I had some other thoughts, and uh, I'm not going to do that, but I want to honor the mothers. Uh, I had a wonderful mother. Uh, she was left with eight of us under 16 years of age when my dad died. He was 47 years of age, passed away very suddenly, and uh, there was a large family of us. There were... 13 in our family in all, and so she was left with all of those under 16 to bring up alone. The youngest was two years old, and uh, of course I was in the middle of that. I was 12 years old at the time, and uh, it was really a struggling, struggling time. We were very, very poor. I'm not going to emphasize that too much, but we were very, very poor. Sometimes didn't know where the next meal was going to come from, and that is really the truth. But the Lord wonderfully undertook for us during those days. And she was a woman who knew what it was to pray. <laughs> I, uh, I was brought up in a home where they had what we called at that time family altar. And it was a time when uh, the family would gather in the morning after breakfast and have Bible reading and prayer. And my dad would get his Bible down and read after breakfast. He would read some scripture to us. And like all children, I always thought it was too long a reading, but he would read a long reading, and then he would pray, and my mother would pray. And they would pray by name for the children. And uh, my name was mentioned many, many times. Maybe because I needed to have it mentioned, I'm not sure, but... Robert would be mentioned, and uh, I never got away from that, even though I got away from the Lord in my teens. I'm ashamed of that. But at the age of 16, almost 17 years old, it was due to my mother's invitation that I went to church and heard the gospel of Christ again, was challenged by it, but didn't make any decision that day. Two weeks later, they had a baptism service because a good number had been saved during that summer. There were two young men came from Bob Jones University, and they had children's meetings, youth meetings around our area, 
And many young people came to know Christ as their Savior. And it was a, it was a wonderful time, really. A lot of people got saved, and a number from our family. And so a number of our family were being baptized. And my mother said, why don't you go to, go to church today and see the baptism? Well, the baptism wasn't at the church. We had no baptistry in the church, but we went down to the water after. But during the message, God was really working in my heart and brought me to himself. And I say that my pastor led me to Christ, but really my mother led me to Christ. And that's really the truth. And she was always so interested in what was happening in my life. And God gave me a hunger for this old book. <laughs> I can't even explain that. I just know that it happened. And I, she gave me a little testament, which I took to work with me. And I read that, and I read it, and read it, and read it. It was marked. They said you should mark it. I had it all marked up. I didn't know half of what I was reading, but I was marking it anyway, and, and the Lord was speaking to my heart through it. And it was just a wonderful time for me. And uh, sensed God's call on my life, one Saturday afternoon when I was reading the Scripture in my bedroom, and God called me into ministry. I didn't understand it then. I don't understand it now, but it was true. God called me to ministry. And... Uh, I wept for a long time, lying over my bed, and the last I got up and I went downstairs, my mother was always someone I could talk to. I said, Mom, something happened to me upstairs. She said, what happened? I said, well, I can't tell you all the details of it, but I, I just sense God wants me in ministry. And I don't know how I'm ever going to do that. She said, you want me to call the pastor? He came down, talked with me, and... The rest is history. I don't need to go into all the rest of that. But God's call in my life, and my mother was the first to know <laughs> that God had called me, and so encouraging through the years. I wrote her letters over and over again on Mother's Day. She kept those letters. I would write her and tell her how much I appreciated her, and I still appreciate her. She died 1994. I still miss her. I called her all the time. I talked with her many, many times. She was someone that really understood and would laugh with me and would cry with me and would do all kinds of different things with me, I guess. She was just a sweetheart, and I honor her today, and I honor all of you mothers here today. Tremendous responsibility you have with your children, and may God give you the grace and strength that you need for these days. Next Friday, we'll be having some meetings with Wendell Calder. He is coming to have a weekend of services with us. He's an evangelist, of course. He's a revivalist. He preaches with great power and passion. He's a, a great preacher of the Word of God. We all know that, I guess, those of us who have heard him preach the gospel. Wendell doesn't bring revival in his briefcase. That is not possible at all. There's such a need, and we need to cry to God for his touch in these awful days. And I thought... I need to do something in preparation for those meetings next fr Friday through Sunday. I didn't know really what I was going to do, and I had preached a message on revival out at, out at Kingsley not too long ago, and I sort of revamped some of the things that I said out there, and I want to say them here because I think maybe it can cause us to think about revival and what it means. I want to give you two or three illustrations before I get into the main part of my message. I was in Bible school, and Linwood Stairs, my pastor, asked me to go with him for some meetings out in Wilmot, where I could lead the singing for him, and he would do the preaching, and there would be an evangelistic crusade, which would last for two weeks. I was living in the Heartland area at that time, and so I would go out there with him in the summertime and uh, had those meetings. They were just wonderful meetings. I, it was a small country church, but the church would be filled night after night. It was a time when God seemed to be moving into the community, and there were so many that came to know Christ. I can remember, the, the, we, we used to call it the altar. I remember the altar being full of people coming to know Christ as their Savior. I knelt beside a good number of those and led them to Jesus Christ. It was a wonderful time of God's moving and God's touch in that area and in that church. 
And I could take you to a good number even yet that are living and that are living for the Lord who came to Christ during those meetings. They were just wonderful meetings. And that's the first time I had been in anything like that. And I was so moved by what I was seeing and what I was taking in into my life at that time. And I thought, this is wonderful. Man, I'd like to see that happening all the time. Well, after Bible school, we married and went down to middle, uh, central Maine where we were pastored. My second pastorate was East, was East Corinth Baptist Church. I'd done some preaching in that church that was very, very rigid and very harsh. I tried to straighten things out from the pulpit. There were, I'm not picking on the ladies this morning, but this is really what happened. There were five ladies in the church that were causing all kinds of difficulty. And I will not go into the details of how that all happened, but it was happening. And I decided as a young pastor, the only way to straighten that out was to preach at them from the pulpit. And you didn't have to guess what I was talking about or who I was talking about. It was harsh and hard and terrible. It wasn't good at all. And one Sunday I preached a message and it was on judgment and God's judgment on us for our sin. And then the Lord dealt with my heart. And he brought me to the place where I realized that I was so wrong. We had our lunch at noontime and about 1.30 a knock came on the door and it was a man whom I respected and loved from the church. And I was young. I was only 24 years of age. He came into the house and he said, Pastor, what's going on? Why is this happening? Why are you preaching like you are? And I could have said, your wife is the biggest toad in the puddle. And I would have been right. But I didn't. He was very emotionally moved. He sat there and wept with me on our couch in the living room. And I said, Lyndon, I know what I have to do. I know what I have to do tomorrow. I'll do it. I'll go talk to those people. He left, and about an hour later, one of the deacons came into the building, into our house, knocked on our door, and came in. And he's a very, he was a very stern sort of guy, and, and I loved him. He was, he was uh, very well respected in the community and well, well respected in the church, and he was a good counselor for me, and I talked with him many, many times, and, and he came in, sat down with me, and asked me the, almost the same questions, and we prayed together, and I told him what I had to do, and he left after prayer with me, and the next morning, Margie and I started out for these homes. We went to the easy ones at first. You know, you're able to pick those because you know the people, and you know maybe they won't like it too much. And I walked into the first home, and she forgave me very easily. It was no problem at all. I went into the next home. That was almost the same. And I went to the third home, and that was great too. And we got through it. I talked to them, for, asked them to forgive me for what I had done. I was so sorry the way I had handled this whole thing. And then I went to one of the ones that I thought would probably be hard, and she was. And uh, she called me everything from a snake right up through to whatever you want to call it. And I didn't say anything. I just sat there like a dummy, I guess. But maybe it's good that I felt like a dummy. I didn't say a word. And when she finished, I said, well, Lillian, you're probably right in everything you've said. But will you forgive me? Oh, she said, yes, I'll forgive you. And we had prayer together, and they became, she and her husband became our very best friends. Isn't that amazing? Then I went to the one I dreaded to go to, the man who came to me and asked me what I was doing wrong. And I could have said, your wife is the biggest toad in the puddle. And, and I went to the, into the yard. We drove into the yard. They were farmers, and, and she was coming out of the house with a bucket in her hand. And I wondered what she had in the bucket. And she had this bucket in her hand and came over to where we were. I rolled down the window and I said, I'd like to talk with you, Eleanor, but I know you're busy. I was hoping she would be real busy. I said, I think you know why I'm here. 
I haven't handled this thing very well, and I'm very sorry because I've done things and said things that I shouldn't have done and said. Will you forgive me? And she broke down and began to cry. I didn't expect that. Oh, she said, Pastor, you are forgiven. We love you. <laughs> well, that was around February of that year. In the spring of that year, we had some evangelistic meetings. I didn't know what would happen in the evangelistic meetings. But God just moved in. Some of you know what I'm talking about when I say God moved in. God began to work in our hearts, my heart as well as the hearts of all the people that were there. And many, many people would go forward and get right with the Lord. It was East Corinth Baptist Church is not a large church, but I suppose a church of about 125 people. And the church was to be filled night after night, and God was moving. And, and I went home one night and sat on the side of my bed, and I said, Oh, God, why, why would you do this when I'm such a poor pastor? I've done things and said things I shouldn't do, shouldn't have said or done. But God moved in. And I think because, as I look back on it, God dealt with my own heart and brought me to the place where I realized that I needed him more than anything else in all the world. And God moved. It was God's moving. It was God's touch. I was sitting in my study one day at Parkside Baptist Church reading a magazine, and the magazine was concerning some meetings that were being held in Saskatoon Church a church in Saskatoon where revival had broken out, and I was very interested in that, and I read through the article, and the more I read, the more I was moved by it. And I said, oh, God, send it here. Send it here. We, too, need revival. We, too, need a touch from your good hand. And the Lord was very gracious, and so many came to know Christ at Parkside Baptist Church when there was a, just a special moving during, during a summer, during a whole summer, God just moved and so many got saved. It was God's moving, God's special touch. I could go on and mention some others that I have listed here. I'm not going to do that. I'm an old man now. I wrote these words. And you know that anyway, don't you? I'm an old man. I guess the desire and longing for God to work is greater than ever before. I'm not a radical. I want things to be run decently and in order. I hate routine for the sake of routine. I love Bible teaching and preaching. I love good music that exalts Christ, whether contemporary or traditional. But the missing ingredient is we can have all of that and know nothing of our Lord's moving in our hearts and in the midst of the church. Revival is not just an emotional move, although our emotions are touched. It is a moving of the Spirit of God. It is His work in our hearts. God reviving the church, God, reviving our hearts. And I'm in need of it as much as you are in need of it. We all need God's special touch. Micah read Psalm 119, those verses that I had listed. I hadn't planned on him reading those. I was going to read them after, but that's okay. But in the New King James Bible and in, our, our, in our, the Old King James Bible, it's revive in it that is mentioned there. It says there, give new life or give life. And that's the same thing, really. But in all of those verses, which I hadn't noticed until just recently, that the word revive is mentioned so many times in Psalm 119. Eight times it's mentioned. And David is writing this, and in the midst of what he's going through, he says, revive me, give us life. Give us life. We don't want to just go through the routine of things. We need life. 
And that should be the cry of your heart and of my heart when we come to these meetings that God will give to us life, that he'll do something in our lives, in our homes, among our kids. Because there's such a desperate need in these days. Now, if we have revival, what does it do? I'm going to mention six things. I want to mention them very quickly because I don't have a lot of time to spend on any one of them. It, it, one, of the, one of the things that happens when there is revival, revival brings life to the individual and to the church. I want you to turn over in your Bibles for just a moment to Acts, the book of Acts in chapter 2, the last part of the chapter. Now, I know this is the first church, and it's very alive. It's going forward. God is blessing it. And as a result of that, down in verse 46, we read these, these words. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. It was a church that was on fire. It had life in it. When we have revival, it brings life to the individual. It brings life to the church. There isn't anything that moves us like God moving. When God moves, we move. When God touches, we're touched. When God does something in our lives, we are changed. We don't look at everybody else. We look at ourselves. And the danger that happened, the thing that happened to me at East Corinth, I was looking at them, but I should have been looking in here. And so often we see everybody else's problems and everybody else's sins, and we forget that we need God's touch as well as everybody else. Number two, revival brings a desire for God, a desire for God. It brings a thirst for Him. Look at chapter 84 of of the Psalms, and we read these words. Listen to this in verse 2. My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. In Psalm 63, it speaks about having a thirst for God. Psalm 42, it speaks about having a thirst for God. You know, I've read many times the book of Philippians, and so have you. But Paul, the apostle, knew the Lord. He knew the Lord better than probably we will ever know the Lord. But he says, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency, the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them as dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of faith by him. And then he says, that I may know him. That I may know. Oh, Paul, don't you know him? Don't you know him? Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. That I may know him. There is something about knowing God or knowing, having a thirst for God that is, is something that really can't be explained. It really can't be explained. Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Let him come to me and drink. And there's an overflow. I've been reading the book Knowing God by J.I. Packer recently. It's a long book. It's a book you've got to get into. It's a doctrinal book, but it's a book that challenges the heart. And it's given me, again, a hunger and a desire after knowing God and living for God. We sort of play with it, I think, sometimes. And it's a danger. It's not church buildings. It's not a better preacher. It's not different people. It's not better singing. It's not better leadership. It's God. And we sit here this morning 
on Mother's Day, and we, we've gone through the musical time and the lovely things on the video and all those things with the kids and so on and so forth. Wonderful. I love those things. I love the singing. I love the whatever's been done here prior to my standing up here and preaching. But we can have all of that, and it can be the best. But there must be somewhere in our hearts a deep hunger for God. Number three, revival brings blessings from heaven. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then we'll hear from heaven. He'll forgive our sins and heal our land. We'll hear from heaven. I don't know all that that means. I just know that there have been times when I've been in places where we've heard from heaven. I wish I could say that this has been true of every service I've ever had, and I would be lying to you if I said that. And I'd like to be able to say to you, every church I ever pastored, there was always just that great blessing. I, I can't say that either. But we have had the touches when God has moved in and there's been blessing from heaven. Number four, revival brings joy to the church. It brings joy to the church. The Philippian church, as I've already mentioned and mentioned some things about the Apostle Paul, is a, is a book of joy. Talks about joy and rejoicing all the way through. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It started out with joy in Acts chapter 16. When Paul and Silas were in prison, you know the story. They sang and prayed. And there was blessing. And people got saved. There's joy when God's in his rightful place in our lives and when he's in, our, in the rightful place in our church. Number five. Revival brings confession of sin. I want you to go to Nehemiah for just a moment, the book of Nehemiah. And in Nehemiah chapter 1, we have a couple of verses I want to read. I just want to draw your attention to them. Nehemiah has been concerned about what's going on in Jerusalem. And down in verse 6, we read these words. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that we may hear the prayer, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. Revival makes us see ourselves as we are. It makes us see ourselves as sinners. It makes us recognize the fact that we need a place of confession and forgiveness. And God does that for us. We were down in New York State having meetings at Perth, New York. And the last Sunday of those meetings, God just moved in and gave a wonderful time of blessing. It was Sunday night. The, there was a great move of God in the morning service. And, and we saw a lot of people come to the Lord and people get right with God. And in the evening, after the evening service, I saw a woman sitting over just to my left from the pulpit, and I saw her sitting there. She just sat there after everybody else pretty much had gone, and, and I went over to see her, sat down alongside of her, and I said, is there something wrong? And she said, oh, very wrong. I said, what's the problem? And she said, I'm a member of this church. She said, I... I work in the church. I teach Sunday school in the church. I've been unfaithful to my husband. I have done a lot of things that I shouldn't have done and still been working in the church. And she said, I don't know whether my mar marriage is going to break up or not. I don't know what's taking place, but I don't think even God could forgive me. And I sat there and talked with her for a little bit, and I showed her 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that dear woman, broken before the Lord, bowed before him and asked the Lord to forgive her. I don't know what happened. I, we left there. I don't know what happened. But I do know what happened to the church. There were a lot of people got right with the Lord. And I do know what happened to the church. The church went on to grow and grow. And the last I knew, they were running over a 1,000 people. 
And a pastor told me later from that area, he said, that all began when you folks were there for evangelistic meetings and God moved in. That's God touching. Revival brings an environment of salvation, number six, and I'm going to be through very quickly. Revival brings an environment for salvation. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want you to listen carefully to this now. Are you listening to me? Okay. If you're listening to me, say amen. amen. All right. This Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I think I speak for probably all of you who know Christ. We want to see God do something, right? We want to see God work. We want to see Him touch. We want to see Him move. And God wants to do that. I hope you don't think that I'm trying to blow my horn here today, because other pastors could tell probably the same kind of things that I'm telling you. But we went out to Brandon, Manitoba to help start a new work. We met the first time in a school building. They bought a supermarket building. We renovated that and became our church. They've added on to that now, have a beautiful auditorium now and a lovely gym and all the rest that goes with that. And that's wonderful what, what's taken place out there. But when we went there, there were about, oh, 40, 50 people that wanted to start a work there. And we went to sort of help lead that and, and to go with it, see what would happen. While we were renovating that place, people would come into the church and I had the opportunity of leading them to Christ. I wondered about that. How is this all taking place? I could name, and I wrote down several names here. John and Louise McDonald. John came in one day, and I talked with him about the Lord. Didn't know his circumstances. Didn't know he was an alcoholic. Didn't know he was losing his business. Didn't know their marriage was on the rocks. That was on Saturday. He and his wife and family came Sunday, and they came the next Sunday, came to prayer meeting as well, and the Sunday evening, and about the third Sunday they were there, they accepted Christ as their Savior. I saw them last summer at a celebration that they were having at the church, and I had the privilege of speaking at that celebration, and they were there, and I sat with them at, at the, at the mealtime, and, and she looked at me, and she said, Pastor, you know you saved our marriage? you know you saved our marriage? I said, no, I didn't save your marriage. God saved your marriage. But those things happened while we were there. God did it. God did it. God did it. And you know what? When you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior and you're seeking to live for Him and seeking to honor Him and please Him, God's going to do something. How can I bring this to a conclusion real quickly? I don't want to leave it up in the air. You don't know how much I've prayed this week, and others have prayed too, that God would move here in our church during these meetings. Do you think God wants to work in our midst? Will you answer that with an amen? Yeah. God wants to work in our midst. Do you want him to work in your heart as well as in the hearts of others? Will you say amen to that? Will you search your heart today? God's sovereign. I believe that with all my heart. God's sovereign. We can't work up revival. God has to do it. And if he doesn't do it, we don't want it. He must do it. And when he works in your heart and in my heart and causes us to get right with God and live the kind of life we ought to live, then there's going to be something of refreshment that reaches out to those around us that need Jesus Christ. You say, oh, you don't know where I work. You don't know what I have to go through every week. <laughs> no, I don't. 
but I know him. And he's sovereign. Revival is not going to come because of Terry Woodcock. Revival is not going to come become because of Michael Hiltz. Revival is not going to come because of Bob Dunlop. Revival is not going to come because of Wendell Calder. As much as I love him and love these others I've mentioned, revival will come when God moves in our hearts. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, I hardly know how to bring this to a conclusion today. You know every heart and every life in this auditorium. You know more about us than we know about ourselves. And you're able to speak to us where we are, and you're able to deal with what we need to deal with in our lives. You can do that. I can't do that. Pastor Terry can't do that. Pastor Micah can't do it. No one else can do it, but you can do it. You can do the work that needs to be done in our heart, and you can draw us to yourself and help us to confess or whatever we need to do to get things right with you so that you can bless and use us for your glory. Bless this congregation. I love Devon Park Baptist Church. I could have, Lord, you know I could have gone back to when this church was thriving with so much going on here and so many being saved and so much taking place that brought honor and glory to your name. I could have mentioned Bruce Moore and mentioned what took place there. That's the past that's gone by us now. And we rejoice in that. And I love Bruce Moore. But he was your servant. We can't rest on what was happening back there. We must, we must have your touch now, Lord. We need it now. So while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, let me ask you to do something. Would you do this for me right now? Just bow your head there and, and will you talk to the Lord for just a moment? I'm going to stop talking. And will you just talk to the Lord for a moment about yourself? Not about the one beside you but about yourself and look into your own heart to see that things are okay. And if there's some things that need to be taken care of, then just ask the Lord, just ask the Lord to touch your life today. I'll let you pray for just a moment. You may be here this morning and you're not saved. You've never received Christ and you've hardly known what I've been talking about. But I want you to know that God loves you and he wants to touch your life with himself. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to have everlasting life. Maybe, maybe we should, as we sing in just a few moments, we should just slip out and come up here to the front and if you're unsaved, you need to be saved, get saved. If you're a Christian and you need to rededicate or dedicate your life to the Lord, you can just come and do that now and just stand here and say, Lord, we want you to work in our midst. I'm not going to beg and coax, but if God has spoken to our hearts this morning, and somehow I think he has, would you move towards the front and just maybe fill this front and we'll have prayer together. I'll not embarrass anybody just want to start this crusade with God's blessing. Father, continue to speak to us now. For Jesus' sake, amen.